Okay, guys. So let me make sure this is all working. Where are my captions? Hello, hello, hello. Let's see. Okay, there are my captions. Share screen. Hello, hello. Can y'all see this? Okay, good. Um, All right, so hi class. So now we're already in week three. In the first week, you got the foundation of the United States Constitution and the amazing, awesome Bill of Rights. Then we dove into more of the nitty gritty, how a case goes from point A to point B. And then this week, week three, we're diving into privacy, specifically tackling for the first time, the Fourth Amendment, which is gonna be, again, the bulk of this class, okay? Um, so, let me go ahead and like I do every week, I like to recap some of the concepts that we go into the previous week. So skipping that one because I actually moved that to this week because I thought there it was too content heavy last week. So ignore those two. Um, today we're going to be focusing on Push that. All right, so hopefully you all can see my screen. Let me get the captions back on here. Okay, there we go. Get here. Hopefully they're here. Okay, so we're ready to rock. So this is, if you can believe it, our third week of class. The first week you all got a strong foundation in the United States Constitution and the amazing, awesome, brilliant Bill of Rights, which are incredible. I'm a fan, you should be a fan too. And then this week we're diving into, for the first time, the Fourth Amendment, which is, as a criminal justice professional, that is your Bible. The Fourth Amendment is the bulk of what guides your behavior as a criminal justice um, professional. Now it is not the only amendment that guides your behavior as a CJ professional, but it is up there. It's, it's numero uno in terms of how important it is to you as a criminal justice professional. So like I do every week, I wanna quickly recap some of the concepts that we tackled last week. So we tackled jurisdiction, which again is the big picture, meaning what state did the crime happen in? And are you dealing with a criminal case or a civil case? Are you dealing with a federal crime or a civil? I mean, I'm sorry, federal crime or state crime, right? You ask those primary questions in the jurisdiction stage, meaning a court has to have proper jurisdiction to hear the case. Secondly, venue. Now venue is that narrow scope where you ask where did the crime happen? What county did Bob commit this crime or these crimes and multiple? Then we looked at states that have a grand jury system versus those that do not. Now remember guys, Texas, is a state that what? Has a grand jury system, we have one. Other states don't, right? It's not, it hasn't been selectively incorporated on the states, meaning um, the United States Supreme Court has not taken that Bill of Right Amendment and applied it to the states. So states are still free as to whether or not to have a grand jury system or not have one. We in the Lone Star State decided to have one. So that's what we have. All right, today we're gonna dip into the pool of the Fourth Amendment, which is some of my favorite topics we'll tackle today. 
We're, we'll explore the exclusionary rule, exculpatory evidence, how search is defined, how seized is defined. Because there's one thing you gotta know about attorneys. We like to define everything. Everything within the Fourth Amendment has a rule, has a definition, and has a standard. And you need to know what those are, okay? So let's go ahead and dive in. So the first thing you're seeing is a door. Why am I showing you some random door? I'll tell you why here in a second. In Weeks versus United States, we're dealing with the year of 1914. And one of the enemies of the federal government was gambling. Gambling was considered the bane of our federal government's existence. And so they actively sought to identify, investigate, and um, arrest those who were engaged in gambling because it was illegal. So Mr. Weeks was one of those individuals. And every day the federal investigators saw him um, receiving a lot of mail uh, on a daily basis. And at that time period, remember, there's no cell phones, you don't have email, you don't have texting. Um, so what that indicated was that he was per perhaps engaged in behavior that reflected illegal activities such as, drum roll, gambling. But they didn't have probable cause because what do you need in order to establish probable cause? You need facts that reflect that someone is engaging in a specific crime or that evidence will be found at a specific place. So there's an element of certainty that needs to be reflected in order to show or argue that you have probable cause. And they just didn't have that yet, right? So they had little pieces of evidence, but nothing concrete enough to get an, a warrant, a search warrant to search his home, right? So what ended up happening is these federal investigators, while Mr. Weeks was at work, kicked down his door, just like Chuck Norris style, boom, entered his home and guess what they found? Yep, evidence of gambling. Mr. Weeks indeed was quite the entrepreneur and was um, a head of a major gambling operation that spanned over several states, not just one state, but several states. So the investigators left. They arrested Mr. Weeks. His door is replaced by a neighbor, right? But the investigators think that they can get more. So again, without a search warrant, they re-enter his house and they look through more places and they find more evidence and they submit all that evidence to the court to support the, um, charges that he was engaged in illegal gambling operations. So that's two doors that they've broken because the neighbors put a temporary door that second time and they did it again, right? So in total, these federal investigators did this three times. So I often wonder, I wonder what the local hardware store was thinking when people kept on coming to buy these doors, like what the heck is going on in Mr. Week's house? Because it was just door after door after door. Well, he was, um, without surprise, convicted. And he went to prison, but he appealed that conviction. And that conviction and that case went all the way to who? If it's a federal crime and you lose at the district court level and you lose at the circuit court level, where's your only option to go? The United States Supreme Court. So the United States Supreme Court held that they didn't have probable cause and they entered into his house in violation of his Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable searches and seizures. They didn't have a right to step a toe into Mr. Week's house, more or less kick down his door, not once, not twice, but three times. That is insanity. So they created what's called the exclusionary rule, which is exactly what it sounds like. They excluded, meaning they kicked out all that evidence that was used against Mr. Week's in trial and his conviction was overturned. Why do we do this? We do not reward bad behavior. We are not going to say, law enforcement, Bob, that's okay. You kicked in the door without a search warrant. We'll let it in anyway, because this Mr. Weeks guy, he is one bad dude. No, we don't reward it. So the exclusionary rule, the rationale behind it was to deter bad behavior on the part of police. But there's always a but, right? Um, the exclusionary rule, as a result of this decision, Weeks versus United States, only applied to federal action. Because remember, Amendments 1 through 10 
only apply to the federal government. It's not until the United States Supreme Court takes that right and selectively incorporates it on a state that it applies to state action, meaning city police officers, uh, city employees, state employees, so on and so forth. So the exclusionary rule after this de decision only applied to federal action. It was not until, dun, 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 MAP versus, and let me move my head so you can actually see this, MAP versus Ohio, that you had the Supreme Court selectively incorporate the exclusionary rule and leash the states, preventing them from violating people's uh, Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable searches and seizures. And if a person's constitutional rights are violated, then any evidence that's obtained against them in support of their uh, in support of the charge or charges that are laid against them, it's kicked out again because we do not reward bad police behavior. So in Matt versus Ohio, I got to warn you. In the beginning of this case, as I described it to you, you're gonna love Mrs. Matt. By the end of this case, you're gonna be like, ugh. Okay, so I'm just warning you. So I'm showing you a picture of, and for those of you who don't know who he is, it shocks me because he was such a big part of American uh, pop culture for so long. That is boxing promoter Don King, and he's famous for his crazy hair. He always made it stand up and do all crazy, you know, <laughs> stand up real tall like that. And he had put together some of the most famous boxing matches in history, um, but he also has a very a questionable reputation for setting up, rigging matches, basically, um, stacking the cards against people uh, in order to lay bets that really aren't fair, right? So why am I showing him? I am showing him because at that time, again, what were investigators obsessed with? Gambling. Again, here comes the gambling. Well, they're extremely concerned that he was engaged in gambling and there was also a related investigation where they thought somebody was planting bombs, okay? Mr. Matt was a boxer and he was going about town, uh, fighting different competitors, doing pretty well on the circuit. And his wife, Mrs. Mapp, she was his right arm man, a uh, woman. <laughs> and one of the things that is really cool about her at that time is this is a time period in which women were not very um, independent. They didn't hold jobs. There's, for the most part, housewives. They were encouraged to not be assertive, independent, loud spoken. She was all of that. She smoked, she drank, she hung out with boxers. She was that kind of lady, right? Well, the investigators had a recording device that could only record numbers that called into Mr. and Mrs. Mapp's household and the numbers that they themselves, the Mapps, had dialed out. So they didn't know what they were talking about, but they knew that Mr. Mapp and Mrs. Mapp had called Don King and Don King called them. And there was this interchange of communications that happened several times over a series of years, right? So they didn't have probable cause. Again, receiving and making a phone call, that doesn't insinuate that you're committing a crime. They could have been talking to Don about the weather or setting up a boxing match for Mr. Mapp, who was a boxer. There's no concrete evidence that indicates that it's more likely than not that Mr. Mapp was engaged in any type of crime. But does that stop the police officers? No. And these are not federal um, actors. These are state actors. These are city uh, law enforcement. So they go to the front door, knock on the door. Now you remember Mrs. Mapp, she was not some meek little sensitive little thing. She was a rough and tough lady who had been, you know, around the roughest, toughest crowd. She answers the door and the first thing she says is, do you have a warrant? And they say no. So she slams the door in their face. Well, they're not very happy with this. So the story goes that they go and get lunch, they get coffee, and what do you get after you eat? A receipt. Well, they went back to her house. They knocked on the door. When she answered it, she said, do you have a warrant? And they said, yep, and they flashed the receipt trying to trick her lying about the fact that they didn't have a search warrant but they wanted her to think that they did she did something very smart she grabbed the receipt and where do you think she put it that nobody would feel comfortable retreating in her bra and for those of you who have ever worked retail 
I think everybody's had that experience where a woman pulls out their money out of their brassiere, and I just got to say why. <laughs> Thankfully, Mrs. Mapp did that, but for everybody else that does that in the in the open public business, that's that's a little ugh, right. Neither here nor there. She puts it in her brassiere in her bra, and they search the entire house. Now they're looking for evidence of illegal gambling and potentially a bombing suspect but they're overturning drawers they're looking under mattresses they're looking in closets and places that would not contain what they're allegedly looking for while they're looking for this evidence they come across something uh, now this is the part where i tell you you're not going to be a fan of mrs matt they lift up the mattress and underneath there is a box and within that box is obscenity now what is the one thing i told y'all typically constitutes obscenity, child pornography. So they arrest her on charges of obscenity and she appeals the decision and it, the case makes it all the way to the Supreme Court who finally takes that selective incorporation leash and leashes the states and also finds that all the evidence that was found um, found against her that was used in support of convicting her was excluded it was kicked out and her charges were overturned as a result because again we do not reward bad behavior had they gone in there with a proper search warrant they could have come across that but they didn't okay so oops i want you to keep in your head that weeks versus united states uh, gave birth to the exclusionary rule but it wasn't until Matt versus Ohio that the exclusionary rule was then applied to state action as well. And that took, look how many years that took. Uh, Weeks versus United States was in 1914 and Matt versus Ohio, 1961. That is a long time um, for state actors to potentially violate constitutional rights and not have that evidence excluded, right? It wasn't until 1961 and the Matt decision that that evidence was excluded from court. Now here you see in this fourth bullet point that it doesn't, uh, the exclusionary rule does not apply to private citizens. And then again, that's because they were only concerned with prohibiting bad behavior on the part of the government, meaning federal law enforcement, state law enforcement, city law enforcement. They weren't concerned with private citizens. So that does not mean that you as a private citizen should go into your neighbor's garage to see if they're making meth. Don't do that. <laughs> you may not, the evidence may not be excluded if you find such evidence and hand it over to police, but you could still get in trouble for trespassing, right? So word of the wise, don't do that. Taking the exclusionary rule a step further, you had a concept of the fruit of the poisonous tree. This means let me find something. I wish I would have my son's uh, tree. Or you know what? I'll just use this. Here we have a tree. The base of this tree is the initial violation, the initial constitutional violation. So remember in weeks when they kept on kicking down the door? That kicking of the door is right down here. That's the foundation of what they did wrong. Any evidence that you find that stems from that initial violation is inadmissible in court because it is considered fruit of the poisonous tree, meaning everything that comes from breaking down that door without a search warrant, everything from that that is, a pr pr is produced as a result of that initial act is poison. It's bleh. It's never going to see the light of day in court. So the point is, don't violate people's constitutional rights as a criminal justice professional, because if you do, all those efforts will be worthless. They'll be all for naught, right? So I'll give you an example. Uh, of a more real world example. If police go into an area and they don't have a search warrant, and let's say they find a piece of paper, and on this piece of paper, it has a list of everything that this um, person who steals for a living, they list all the places that they've sold all their stolen mer merchandise to. The officers can't there thereby go to that pawn shop and find that uh, merchandise and use it in support of the charges that are brought against that person. They can't do that because they would never have known about this information to go to this specific place had they not violated that person's constitutional rights. You see how that works? So just think of it this way. Anything that you do in response to violating that person's constitutional rights will be 
um, wasted effort because anything that you get as a result of that violation will be inadmissible in court because of the exclusionary rule, all right? All right, so you know the cheese, it's Swiss cheese. It has all the holes in it, right? As you will see throughout this term, every standard that lawyers put together, like the exclusionary rule, has exceptions. There's exceptions to everything because life is not black and white. There are always situations, there's always instances which reflect um, something that touches maybe on the, the, the border of maybe permissible, maybe not, right? So let's look at some of those exceptions. Plain view. If an officer, is, let's say, goes in, up to a house and they don't have probable cause to, but they see somebody with a knife who's about to stab somebody else, they can, of course, go in and, well, one, stop the situation, but two, retrieve that knife and use it as evidence um, against that person in the court of law. Plain view, and we'll go more in depth on plain view in chapter 10, but in a nutshell, it's when you as an officer see something that um, is unmistakably criminal in nature, that without a doubt, it is contraband, it's drugs, it's a weapon. And as a result, plain view, you can seize it without a warrant, okay? So plain view is an exception to the exclusionary rule. Secondly is the good faith exception. And this happens more often than you think. So I'll give you a, a real world example again. If an officer stops somebody and for speeding and when they run their driver's license, it flags that person as having an unpaid, uh, several unpaid tickets and as a result, a warrant out for their arrest. And that officer thereby arrests that person, then they're in good faith, right? But what if, what if that warrant was wrong, that that person actually did pay their tickets, but somebody at the courthouse did not enter it correctly, and therefore it's a mistake? Would the officer have reason to know that? No. An officer trusts the technology, the information that's granted to them, right? So if they uh, are arresting that person based on their good faith information, based on that warrant that they're getting after they've run their license, and while they're arresting that person, they see that they have bags of marijuana in their back seat. That can be seizable, and it's not um, excluded in court because that officer was in good faith when they violated that person's constitutional rights by seizing them based on a mistake. The third is called inevitable discovery. This means that the evidence would have been found anyway, with or without a warrant. Um, this comes from a case in which, and it's really awful, a little girl was raped and murdered and they were trying to find her body in the woods. Well, at the time they didn't know specifically if it was the woods, but they brought in the suspect and they questioned him for hours. He didn't have an attorney. He wasn't read his Miranda rights. So clear violations of his constitutional rights, right? So typically, had he given them information, anything that would have come from it would have been inadmissible because of the exclusionary rule and because fruit of the poisonous tree. Again, we don't reward officers' uh, bad behavior. But when the suspect said she is in this part of the woods and he circled it on the map, the investigators reasoned that they would have found that her body anyway because they had search parties and lines going combing through the forest and would have come upon her anyway. So her body and the um, evidence contained on her body was not inadmissible. It wasn't excluded from court because inevitably it would have been discovered. All right, so the exclusionary rule is not without its criticisms. You may have thought of some as I was lecturing, um, but some of them include the fact that per police officers typically are not personally impacted, meaning for the map case, map versus Ohio, the evidence that those officers obtained, a child pornography, it was excluded from court and she eventually walked free. But nothing um, was done to those officers that used deception in order to access, to enter her home. So typically um, these officers are not held to account at the court level. They may, and I say may, be disciplined by their department but typically they're not personally impacted by the evidence being excluded. That's just a byproduct, right? 
Secondly, there is the argument that police officers aren't deterred because there are so few prosecutions against officers as a result of a legal seizure. So again, those are arguments to be made. I want you to be aware of them. I don't throw my hat one way or the other. Again, it's not the law according to Shaw. I just present the facts and then you can absorb them and interpret them as you may. And then, oh, the third, which I've heard many times, is that allow some factually guilty individuals to go free. My response to this third bullet point would be then do things in a constitutional manner. Don't violate people's rights, and then you won't have the fear of it being excluded. All right. So now we're going to move on to what's called exculpatory evidence. Now, oftentimes students get confused between um, the exclusionary rule and exculpatory evidence. Just remember it this way, exclusionary excludes evidence, it kicks it out. Exculpatory evidence is what should be brought in, okay? So I have this picture of Beavis and Butthead, which is a famous cartoon from the 90s. I remember I used to get so sick of my friends trying to uh, uh, impersonate them, <laughs> but they are perfect in, uh, reflections of Brady. Poor Brady. I'll tell you why I say poor Brady. So poor Brady, he was madly in love with this young girl. And there was an issue though. Now I wanna show you, it is 1963. So a time period in which divorce was not common and people were expected to live at a certain moral and ethical platitude, right? Well, again, Brady was madly in love with her, but she was married. They had an affair for years and uh, she eventually got pregnant, not by her husband, but by Brady. Brady was best friends with her brother and they devised a plan. Now, let me see if I have a picture of it. Oh, I didn't include it. They devised a plan. He wrote her a check, Brady did. He wrote her a check for some ungodly amount, like $65,000 and said, I will take care of you, I love you. But do you think he actually had that money in his account? No, absolutely not. So Brady and the girl's brother devised a plan to go rob a bank, but there was another problem. Brady didn't have a car and neither did the girl's brother. So they had to steal one. So Brady knew that one of his neighbors had just gotten this awesome new car. It was like a Ford Fairlane or something. And those are like boats, they're huge. And they knew that at a certain time every morning, this neighbor would leave his driveway and go down a specific street in order to go to work every morning. So they devised a plan that they put a log in the road right where he would eventually be driving. And when somebody sees a log in the road, what do they typically have to do? You have to get out and move it. That's exactly what the man did. And Brady and the brother bonk him over the head with the butt of a gun and they throw him in the trunk. Now, Brady never allegedly intended to kill the man, but what occurred was the trunk was partially open, flapping, they're taking off, the guy hops out of the trunk, kind of like in the movie Hunt Hangover. <laughs> you just picture this guy hopping up out of the trunk, uh, the trunk of the car, and he books it to the woods. Brady um, follows the other man, the young girl's brother, who's chasing in hot pursuit after this guy. The guy takes off his shirt and uses it to strangle this poor old man and they kill him. They go back to the vehicle and I don't think they even ended up uh, robbing anything. So the murder was for nothing, right? Well, you should never commit murder, but in their case, it didn't help them achieve anything. They didn't get the money. They ended up murdering somebody and now they have a stolen car. They were eventually arrested. And there's a really interesting article that I'll forward to y'all because the investigators had to chase Brady down to Cuba um, almost, and it's a crazy story. It should be made into a movie, but I'll afford that to you um, at some point this week. But regardless, when they went to trial, um, it came out that Brady and the brother had been uh, in interrogated for many, many hours. That's not the issue. The issue is this. When Brady was asked, did you commit murder? Did you kill this man? He said, no, 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 no. And he kept on saying no. He never said that he helped to kill this man. The brother initially said, well, I didn't do it, Brady did. I didn't do it, Brady did. not But the third time he was asked, he said, you know what, you're right. Brady didn't do it, I did it. He didn't kill him, I did. 
But when it came to trial, which confessions do you think were handed over? Not the third one. The third one in which the brother admitted that he himself committed murder was never entered into trial. So Brady and the brother were convicted and sentenced to death. Now, Brady appealed the conviction and it wasn't until a mistake was made in which on appeal, um, you imagine that some secretary, probably a paralegal was forwarding all this information, all this evidence to the appellate attorney and she accidentally slipped in that confession. So the question therefore became, did Brady have a fair trial since he was missing this vital piece of information? Don't you think the jury would have seen that and said, well, wait a minute, this guy fully confessed to committing murder. Would have made a difference, right? So as a result of Brady versus Maryland, that the courts created the concept of exculpatory evidence, which means the government must hand over evidence that's favorable to the defense. So there's elements. Exculpatory evidence is number one, suppressed by the prosecution, meaning the prosecutor must have it in his or her possession. Two, it has to be favorable to the defendant. Now pause. It doesn't have to be the smoking gun, meaning it doesn't have to 100% prove that the defendant did not commit the crime. It just has to be favorable. So if it even helps the defendant even a little bit, it can be classified and should be classified as exculpatory evidence. So as long as there's a reasonable probability that the evidence would have made a difference. Third, if the material is admissible. So if it's hearsay, it's not admissible and the prosecutor doesn't have to hand it over. So an, an example of, of um, Admiss inadmissible evidence is hearsay. And remember, hearsay is when you say, well, my neighbor's uncle's best friend's son said, blah. Too many links in that chain. There's too many people. The only thing that's admissible is uh, evidence that that person directly saw or heard, okay? Now, you used to have to have the defense request exculpatory evidence, but that's no longer required. It's just automatic the prosecution, the state has to automatically hand over um, exculpatory evidence. All right, so now we're gonna get into privacy. Um, and I'll go over that in here in a second. Now I show a picture of a giant castle because I think most of us have heard the saying that every person's home is their castle, right? Indicating that we as a society have a very heightened expectation of privacy and where we live, right? We don't. We have a, a privacy bubble that protects us from people invading our personal space. I think we've all had that uh, experience where we're maybe talking with somebody who's that close talker, right? They like get up right in your face and, and invade your personal space and you feel weird, right? Well, that space has a heightened protection under the United States Constitution. Specifically, you owe it. Let me put this right here. Let me make my head smaller. Sorry about that, guys. Let me go back. There we go. Um, specifically, in the Fourth Amendment, it guarantees that people are free against unreasonable searches and seizures. So here today, any warrant, uh, any search that occurs without a warrant is presumed unreasonable because you have to prove that you have justification for even stepping a toe into a person's private space, especially their home. So if you do that, remember the exclusionary rule will kick out evidence that's obtained without a search warrant, unless it falls under one of those exceptions I went over. Now today, the million dollar question is, how do you determine if a search was unreasonable or if a search even occurred? Now, initially in this question, in this field, we only focus on whether somebody physically intruded into a protected space. So in Olmstead versus United States, let me move my head again, um, they were concerned with bootlegging, right? And they put in a tap, they tapped somebody's phone without a search warrant, but they reasoned that it was not a 
by unreasonable search. It didn't violate that person's Fourth Amendment right because they never physically entered into their apartment. Rather, they were able to tap their phone from the basement of the apartment building. So the United States Supreme Court and United States versus, I mean, Olmstead versus United States, they set the bar as to whether or not in law enforcement physically entered into the person's physical private space, meaning their apartment, their home. Now, that continued on into subsequent cases, subsequent cases. In Goldman versus United States, the officers, again, were dealing with um, wiretapping a person's home. But in this case, there are two apartments, one right next to each other. This is the apartment. This is the side they were concerned with. This is the defendant's side. And they were concerned that he was engaged in criminal behavior. They went to the apartment next door and they took a specific um, wiretapping device that could be li literally kind of like listening on the wall. And they didn't ever have to physically enter into this person's apartment. They were able to hear everything that was going on by simply attaching the device to the wall. So again, the United States Supreme Court said that's not a violation because again, they never physically entered into that defendant's apartment. So a search warrant wasn't needed. Now this changed as re and it, uh, somewhat slowly over time. In Silverman versus United States, um, the investigators used a spike mic and a heating duct, meaning they took this long wire, just picture this, well, I'm trying to think, of, oh, okay, here we go. Pretend my earphones are spike mic. They snaked it into the heating duct and just by even like a little centimeter, worth of space they entered into the defendant's property. Now they never physically entered into the property but their spike mic did, even if it was just by a few centimeters. And so we start to see the United States Supreme Court kind of expand what they considered a search and they said, this is unreasonable because that spike mic, even though it entered into the defendant's space by just a couple centimeters was still a physical intrusion. Therefore they did need a search warrant. Now, oops, uh, same thing with Clinton versus Virginia. They stuck a mic in the wall and just a little bit entered into the defendant's property. So they said there as well, they need a search warrant. So the theme between these four cases is that there's physical penetration. That's what they focused on, whether or not there was or was not any type of physical penetration into the defendant's property, even if it is just a minute amount, even if it's just a few centimeters. Now, it wasn't until Cats versus United States, which is such a cool case because it is 2021 and we are still relying on the Cats case, the case to determine whether or not a search has occurred, meaning whether or not we require a search warrant. In that case, 1967, they're again obsessed with what? Gambling. So these investigators saw Mr. Katz going constantly to this phone booth. He'd go in the phone booth, close the door, make calls every day for hours on end. Now that didn't give them probable cause. Just because somebody's on the phone a lot every day doesn't mean they're committing a crime. So they couldn't get a search warrant. But regardless, they wiretapped that phone and were able to confirm that Katz, yep, he was absolutely involved in gambling. The question before the court was whether or not the officer should have obtained a search warrant. We're talking about a public phone booth, not a house, not an apartment, not a business office. So should they have obtained a search warrant? And for the first time, the Supreme Court expanded their, uh, what they included as protected and they said, absolutely and they created this test. Now, I want you guys to know this test backwards and forwards. First, does that person have an actual expectation of privacy? And two, is it one society agrees with, recognizes? So let's revisit Katz. Katz goes into a phone booth, and what does he do when he enters the phone booth? He closes the door. So does that suggest to you that he wants privacy? Absolutely. And is it one that society recognizes? Yeah, typically a person wouldn't go up to a phone booth and just rip open the door and listen into what somebody's saying. So 
because the answer is yes to both of those questions, a search warrant is needed. And as a result, in Katz, all that evidence that they obtained against him was excluded because it was obtained in violation of his constitutional right against unreasonable searches. So what about this situation? If you're on an elevator with a bunch of people and you're on your phone, let's say this woman right here, Let's say she's a law enforcement officer. Does she have to have a search warrant in order to record what the others are saying? No. Why? Because do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy and things that you say in close proximity to others in a public elevator? No. And that's typically not one that society would agree with. What about if you're walking down the street and you're on your phone? Again, the answer for most people would be no, because do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the things that you say in public on your cell phone? No. And is it one that society is prepared to agree with? No. What about this in your car? Now let's say you get in your car, you get on your cell phone. Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? The answer for most people is yes. Because this is very analogous to the phone booth situation. In the phone booth, you get in the phone booth and you close the door. Likewise, when you get in your car, you close the door. This is showing the world that you expect privacy. And it's one that society is generally uh, geared to recognize. All right, so in 2013, not a very old case, in Florida versus Hardeen, a suspect was... Um, <clears throat> Investigators suspected that this individual was growing marijuana, but they didn't have probable cause. They had details that would lend one to believe that they might be engaged in growing marijuana, but they didn't have anything to establish probable cause in order to get a search warrant. Now, I included a link to the actual oral arguments that were made before the United States Supreme Court. For those of you who are interested in going to law school, Listen to this. It is really interesting. And it's fun to see how these lawyers phrased their cases in order to get the end result, which we'll look at here in a second. So visually, they inspected the home. There were no cars, no traffic indicating uh, a drug sales, right? So they approached the home with a drug sniffing dog. Now, drug sniffing dogs, they're trained to identify and um, Bracket. Bracket means they'll start barking a lot when they hit, hit a green, meaning they have confirmed that they smell something illicit, like contraband. Now, this dog went up and down the, the, the porch and he starts bracketing, barking like crazy at the front door, indicating that somewhere inside that house is marijuana. So they leave and they obtain a search warrant based off of the dog's drug sniff, the sniff for drugs. The court ultimately ruled this was a Fourth Amendment violation. Why? Do you have an expectation of privacy in your porch and in the contents of your home? Most people would say yes, and it's one that people are typically geared to recognize, meaning those officers would never have known what was inside that home had they not used a dog that was able to, through the sense of smell, confirm what was inside that house. Now remember, that's a constitutional violation and under the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, anything that they get as a result of that initial violation is inadmissible in court, it's excluded. So again, anytime you are confronted with a search, go through that two part test. Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? And is it one that society is geared to recognize? If the answer is yes to both, get a warrant. Now cars are a little bit different. Cars have been deemed to be okay for dogs to be used as drug sniffing dogs, especially at the border, because car, cars are not like a house. Cars move and the evidence can move very quickly with the car. So the United States Supreme Court has reason that you do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy and the contents of your car from a dog sniff, meaning the dog going around your vehicle, especially at, um, board, at the border to determine whether or not you're carrying illicit contents, contraband. Now, 
Anytime you evaluate whether or not a search has occurred, the second thing you must do is to evaluate whether or not there's been a proper seizure, meaning when the stuff's been taken as a result of the search. So a seizure, the technical um, definition is it's when there's been a meaningful interference with an individual's possessory interest. So you're taking away something, uh, preventing that person from using something that they own. The case in which that stems from is Maryland versus, let me see if I can move this real quick so you can see the name. May, from Louisiana, we would say Maison, but you may say Macon, either way, but kind of an old case. In this case, there was a plain clothed officer. They enter an adult bookstore, which they heard sells obscenity, meaning child pornography. He does not have a search warrant. So he enters the adult bookstore and he buys two magazines. Now he pays for these magazines with $50, meaning he found the two illicit obscene child pornography magazines, goes to the counter, gives the owner $50, $50 for the magazines. And in exchange, the owner gives him the magazines and a receipt. Important detail. So he goes outside and he shows them to his fellow officers and they conclude that they were obscene and they re-enter the adult bookstore and they arrest the clerk who's also the owner. Now let's go through the analysis. Do you have a, do you have a privacy right? Do you have an expectation of privacy in the contents of your store that's public? No. And would society think you would? Also no. So because both of those answers are no, the officer didn't need a search warrant. So now you go to the second question. Was there a meaningful interference with the owner's possessory interest? Again, the answer is no. Why? Because the owner no longer possessed those, uh, those two magazines. He exchanged them for money. The officer paid him $50 in exchange for the owner's possessory interest in those magazines. So because of that exchange, there is no meaningful interference. And so this was not an improper seizure. This was an A-OK, -okay, good seizure. So good search, good seizure, everything's fine and legit. So anytime that I give you a hypothetical, let's say in the exam, I wanna make sure that you go through those tests. You have to ask first, was there, does the person have a, a reasonable expectation of privacy and is it one that society agrees with? If the answer is yes to both, then you need a search warrant and there is a search. But if the answer is no to both, then it's not a search and you don't have to have a search warrant. Then you ask whether or not there's a meaningful interference with the person's possessory interest. If the answer is no, then it's a good seizure. But if it's if the answer is yes, there was a meaningful interference with their possessory interest, you're going to have a Fourth Amendment violation. All right. Oop. Sorry. I mean, skip ahead a little bit. So there's one other thing I want to go over today, which is fairly recently. Let me move this so you can see. In Kilo versus United States in 2001. So to me, that's somewhat recent. For y'all, you might have been like born in 2001. Um, in Kilo versus United States, you had officers who use a thermal imaging device to determine whether or not a lot of heat was emanating from this individual's, from Mr. Kilo's house. And what they were trying to establish was that Kilo was engaged in a massive marijuana growing enterprise. And they thought they could establish that by showing that a massive amount of heat was emanating from a specific spot in his house. They did not have probable cause. They only had circumstantial evidence, so they couldn't get a search warrant. So they used, again, this thermal imaging device from their patrol car outside the person's property. The person did indeed have a marijuana growing operation. He was convicted and his case reached all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Now, I highly recommend that you listen to this case at this moment because this is this shows that the United States Supreme Court justices, they can be pretty funny, guys. Um, Souter, in particular, makes some pretty funny jokes here, but listen to it and see what I'm talking about. In particular, they make a joke about being in the bathroom and it makes you giggle. One, because it's coming from this like very huffy puffy, you know, Supreme Court justice. 
but two, because it's just funny. All right, so what this case ultimately held was that the government can use technology um, if it's in general public usage. Now, I wanna say that again, I really want you to think about what they're saying. Law enforcement can use technology that's in general public use without a search warrant. Now in 2001, thermal imaging devices were not in general public usage. So they found under this case, under this rationale that they should have had a search warrant. But it's 2021, I want y'all to do an exercise. Go into Amazon or Google and look for a thermal imaging device. How many places have it? Everyone, and you can find one for like 80 bucks. So the question now is can officers now use a thermal imaging device without a, a search warrant in light of the fact that it is now in general public usage? What about drones? In 2001, nobody had a drone. That was like sci-fi and weird. In 2021, almost everybody has a drone. My child who's five plays with a drone. So think about the door that this rationale, this case holding potentially opens, okay? Just food for thought. All right, so that is the end of today's lecture. I hope you all enjoy the material as much as I enjoy teaching it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let me know. Other than that, adios, have a great day, and don't hesitate to ask me any questions if you have some.